Ever been sidelined when it comes to understanding South Korea at an important meeting, conference or discussion? You won't be if you become a member of Korea Pro, your one-stop solution to staying updated with the latest in South Korea's politics, society, economy and foreign relations. Picture this, every morning you wake up to a newsletter that gives you a full aggregation of all the top news and analysis. It's handcrafted by the producers of NK Pro and NK News, so you can trust it to save you time and keep you ahead of the news cycle. In addition, the Korea Pro Week Ahead newsletter flags upcoming conferences, events and major diplomatic and business developments. And of course, there's in-depth specialist analysis to keep you informed on the top issues of the day which you won't find anywhere else. Korea Pro is produced by a wide range of specialists, including in-house analysts and external contributors. There are no ads or sponsored articles on Korea Pro. Unlike some of its South Korean competitors, Korea Pro provides hard-hitting and objective analysis without hidden agendas. For my listeners today, I've got something special. Use the coupon code PODCAST when you subscribe and get a 25% discount. Just head to careerpro.org slash podcast. Use the coupon code podcast when you subscribe and get a 25% discount. Just head to careerpro.org slash podcast. That's careerpro.org slash podcast. Make the smart choice. Choose Career Pro. Listeners, and welcome to the NK News Podcast. I'm your host, Jacko Zwetslut, and this is recorded on Tuesday, the 19th of December. I'm sitting here in the NK News office studio with Brian Betts, Senior Managing Editor of NK News. Welcome back on the show, Brian. Thank you, Jacko. Glad to be here. Has it been a quiet week this week in uh, North Korea watching? It has not. It has not been a quiet week. <laughs> it's been quite the eventful week. All hands on deck, so to speak? Uh, yeah. What's been going on there? Well, it started Sunday night when around, I don't know, about 10.40 p.m., North Korea launched what turned out to be a short-range ballistic missile. We did not know that at the time. Right, because they, they don't say this is the kind of missile we're launching. Yeah, How do we know that? Is it looking at the trajectory and where it lands or that sort of data? Yeah, so it's just the South Korean government or South Korean military and mm. Japanese military who released this information. They announced immediately after a launch when it's happened and then... They provide some updates over the next few hours, usually, right. on range, where landed, all that stuff. So this was launched from the surf, from the land? Yes, it was launched from Pyongyang area. Ah. Seoul did not specify exactly where. Mm -hmm. And it flew, well, there were different assessments between South Korea and Japan. Ah. But, you know, two to three hundred miles or so, and landed in the East Sea, Sea of Japan. Okay, so it more or less flew all the way over the North Korean peninsula. Right, so if, if, if it had gone wrong, if somehow that missile had failed yep. in the first couple of hundred kilometers, it would have landed in North Korean territory. That's true. Wow. But uh, they've generally sh had good success rates with the, the short-range right. missiles of late, so I think they're pretty confident. Yeah, and they've got that launch base there near Sunan Airport, haven't they? Well, yeah, it's basically just the airport itself. Oh, it's you know, I mean, it's just I don't know if they do it from the exact runway, but, you know, there's quite unusual that they're launching it from right around there. You right. Know? Yeah, okay. And then there was something else. Yeah, and uh, well, first of all, mm. so that, that Sunday night launch, it was attracting our attention in part because the previous week on Thursday, Kim Tae-ho, who is from the Presidential National Security Office, said that South Korea, there's a good chance that North Korea was going to launch an ICBM, that's an intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missile, ah. in December. So it turned out that Sunday night launch was not that missile. Right. But then Monday morning... It was around, I don't know, 8.20, so it was 8.24 a.m. Seoul time. There was another missile launch from the Pyongyang area, mm. and the details that came out from South Korea and Japan later indicated that they believed it was uh, an ICBM. Okay, so that's two missile launches within 12 hours of each other. Uh, 10 hours, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Very so close succession. Very, yeah. and, and from the same area. So we don't know exactly where they launched the short-range ballistic missile from. North Korea has not said, and uh, South Korean military has not said. Mm. But we do know now that the uh, ICBM was not launched from the 
Sunan uh, ah. Airport. Okay. Uh, it was instead launched from a road next to this fruit farm, huh. kind of on the outskirts of Pyongyang. Just from a road? Yeah. Okay. Now, what, do from we an, know? Uh, one of these road mobile launchers, they call ah. it a, a TEL, a transport Trans- director launcher. Yeah. Right. So they drove it out to this spot and yeah, launched it from there. Would we normally expect that to be a solid or a, a, a liquid uh, fuel missile? So this one was a, uh, was a solid fuel. Okay, uh, so you don't really need we, a lot of we time. We didn't know this yesterday, but uh, just this morning, mm-hmm. North Korean state media, the Rodong Shinmun, yeah. released a report showing that Kim Jong-un, with his daughter in tow, had, Again? Yes, had overseen uh-huh. uh, this launch of the Hwasong-18, ah. which is North Korea's solid fuel ICBM. Yep. This is the third successful test of the missile also third ever, mm. all of which have taken place this year. Wow. Yeah, this is a big year for the Hwasong 18, you said, right? Right, right. Hwasong 18. Do we know if this one has, did it test a re-entry vehicle? It, was that on the, was that part of the uh, the test? So North Korea didn't reveal the kinda, those kinds of technical details. Yeah. Basically, though, f- based on what we know, the launch resembled the uh, previous two. Mm-hmm. It was a lofted launch, so it's not on a normal trajectory testing the full range of the the missile which is you know uh, theoretically capable of reaching the continental US right rather it was so launched it very very high yep. basically in, you know into space and fell into the uh, east sea sea of japan right yeah so for our listeners there so a lofted launch or a lofted trajectory is it, it it looks kind of like an upside down v so it goes up and it comes down and rather than as you would say, going all the way across the Pacific Ocean from Korea to America. Yep. Very, very steep parabola. I mm. believe Red X would say that you, it, this, the missile was flying well above where the International Space Station wow. uh, would be. It's, I mean, okay. it's, going, it's going way up there. That's yeah. way up there. Okay. So it, it did exit the atmosphere and re-enter it then? Yes. Yeah, it was and going that high. Yeah, yeah and it was in flight for 73 minutes or so. Wow. So yeah, it was a big launch of a big missile. Did it issue any warnings beforehand to ships in the sea? Hey, we're going to do this thing, stay out of the area? No, North Korea doesn't usually do that for the uh, the missile launches. Right. Anyway. For satellites, it does. Mm-hmm. But it's the same technology, right? So in theory, I mean, if it's a responsible state actor, it should be warning, we're going to do this thing, stay out of the area. Correct. Okay. All right. But as far as I know, has anything been hit by it, uh, but this this ICBM on the way down? Any ships I have not in heard the way? any reports about that, no. Right. Hmm. So the other thing I should add, though, is is what North Korea said about why they why they launched it, ah. and they kind of already indicated the reason uh, yesterday. The mm-hmm. Defense Ministry released a statement in which they criticized two things. One was a U.S. nuclear powered submarine arrived in Busan okay. on Sunday, the USS Missouri. It's nuclear powered, so the engine nuclear is powered. runs off of a nuclear reactor. Right, it doesn't mean it necessarily has nuclear weapons. Correct, it's not a nuclear missile submarine. Ah, okay. Uh, which also visited the peninsula middle year, maybe July-ish. I can't remember the exact date. Well, that was a different sub, wasn't it? But that was a different sub. And, yeah. and that particular visit was the first time a sub of that type had ah. visited in 40 years or something. Wow, okay. Right. But it is still considered a strategic U.S. asset. It's mm-hmm. Certainly, you know, it's here as part of U.S. attempts to demonstrate its extended deterrence extended commitments deterrence. and all of that. Yeah. So yes, North so that's Korea one said, thing that North Korea didn't like that, and yep. they didn't like that the U.S. and South Korea had a the second meeting of their nuclear consultative group, mm-hmm. which, as you recall, was something that was inaugurated as part of the Washington Declaration, agreed to between Biden and uh, Yoon Suk Yeol earlier this year. I believe yeah. that was April during uh, President Biden's uh, state visit to to Washington. Uh, sorry, President, President Yoon's right, right. state visit to Washington. Yes, gosh. So, so the whole purpose of that group is for the U.S. and South Korea to have a space where they can talk about uh, nuclear planning as it pertains to extended deterrence. Mm-hmm. North Korea sees this as, oh, they're, they're plotting to nuke us, you know. You know. Right. Um, so it reacted very strongly to both these things and mm-hmm. said, this Hwasong-18 launch is sending a clear warning to the uh, U.S. and South Korean military gangsters it's it's showing that uh, North Korea is capable of, of conducting such a launch if ever the Washington makes the wrong move. Mm. So they uh, there was a clear message they were trying to send with this uh, right this particular missile. Did it not mention South Korean puppets? Uh, that I'm not sure. Okay, so the the real it, it focus. Defi- it definitely mentioned South Korean military gangsters. Gangsters. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. So we had two missile launches. Uh, mm-hmm. Anything else that's been hot on the radar in the last couple of days? 
Well, that's sort of been the, the focus of the last couple days. Though last week there were a few other interesting developments. I'd say the main one to flag would be that there was this Russian delegation mm. from the Far uh, East, from the Far Primorsky East, Primorsky Cry. Cry yeah. uh, the governor of Primorsky Cry led a delegation to Pyongyang. They arrived, I believe, it was on Monday. Mm-hmm. Flew out on Friday, and they had a bunch of meetings. They met North Korea's premier and other top officials. This was not a complete surprise. They had announced it that it would happen this year. But you know, they were there to talk about economic cooperation uh-huh. and especially tourism. Which way? Well, primarily Russia to North Korea. Okay, yeah. uh, with- North Korean tourists are not really a big uh, no. Well, you got to ask that. Yeah. Because I, I don't recall, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that Russian tourists have always gone to North Korea in some numbers, but it, it, it's never been as big as, say, Chinese tourism to North Korea. So it's interesting they want to focus on this now. Yeah, it's quite small. Interestingly, though, uh, after the delegation returned, mm. the Primorsky Cry uh, region released you know, some information about the meetings and said North Korea is interested in bringing more Russian tourists once they sort of fully reopen. Okay. So again, we're still looking into the future, right? It's still looking into the future. It's yeah. still sort of predicated on when things open up more. Right. But apparently the, the DPRK expressed interest in also increasing transportation routes between the countries to, mm. uh, in, in part to facilitate such tourism. Right. They want to have more regular train service. Yeah. You know, of course, there's already trains, train tracks connecting the countries. But sure. they want There's no like regular passenger train service. So they want that. They want a maritime route Mm -hmm. from Vladivostok down to North Korea's northeast and all the way down to Mount Kumgang. Oh, Uh, all the way down. Stopping at various points along the way, like at at Rajin and Wonsan. Yeah, maybe Chongjin as well. Would that be... Yeah, Chongjin uh, as well also. Would that be mainly for tourists or are they they talking about sort of everything, you know, tourism and a bit of cargo? I I I think tourism appears to be the main purpose. Wow. Um, Although I think there's a lot of uh, unclarity. Mm-hmm. Not a lot of details that were released. The third thing is that they, were, well, they want more flights, more air courier flights. Right. There was before pandemic a regular uh, Vladivostok to Pyongyang flight. Uh, mm-hmm. What I think twice, maybe three times a week, and they mm-hmm. want to they want to step that. Well, it's probably been zero for COVID, so they want to restart that and step it up, maybe. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing is there currently appears to be two flights a week. Oh, there already are. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, on Monday and Friday. Ah. So the, the delegation actually just took the regular flight that was already scheduled ah. on, on the Mondays and Fridays. Okay. And that appears to be scheduled for the next few months. We'll see whether that yeah. continues. And, and you said North Korea wants to have more of it, more regular flights. Well, it's, it's unclear. They want rec- at least some regular flights. To, okay. Yeah. Possibly also flights to other places in mm. North Korea. It's unclear because the Russian delegation visited... North Korea's tourist ski resort. Oh, Mashigryong? Yeah. Okay. Did they also go to Wonsan, to the uh, the, the stalled Kalma Peninsula resort well, town? Well, they, they, dis- they discussed that. Yeah, they, they discussed Russian tourism to that ski resort mm. and to Wonsan Kalma. Okay. Um, which is odd because, as you know, Wonsan Kalma is still unfinished. It, uh, yes, yeah. And it's also a huge facility. It's a huge, you know. Yeah, right. You could put a lot of people in there. Hundreds, thousands. Right. And what I've heard from tourism experts is they, they suspect that the real purpose of Wonsan Kalma was for South Korean tourists because right. the only country that could send mm. tourists in, in such numbers in such numbers would yeah. be South Korea, even China, which by far sent, I think it was like 90, 95% of all the tourists before the pandemic. Yeah. Even those numbers probably is not enough, I understand. Right. The Russian Far East is not going to be able to send tourists in large enough numbers yeah. uh, to fill that resort. Yeah, I, I don't. It's it's difficult to imagine thousands of Russians from Vladivostok and the uh, Primorsky Krai region uh, hopping on a ship and going down to Wonsan Kalma for what a week of sun I- in the summer. Right. You'd think most Russians probably have other destinations in mind. <laughs> uh, yeah. And the same goes for the ski resort. I, right. I don't think the Russian Far East is uh, lacking for snow. That's true. Hmm. Well, but time will tell. Now, this, of course, is our last episode before Christmas. Mm-hmm. So let's also remember that uh, the 24th of December is the North Korean version of Christmas, and that is Kim Jong-suk's birthday. Yeah. So happy Kim Jong-suk birthday. Thank you. Brian. And happy Kim Jong-suk birthday to you as well. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. All right. We'll see you uh, in the new year. All right. Stay tuned because after this break, we have an interview with the Deputy Secretary of the United Nations Command Military Armistice Commission, Dr. Michael Bozak. (laughs) 
MK News has launched a new app that makes staying updated on all things North Korea easier than ever. The app gives access to the latest articles so you'll never miss a breaking story. It's fast, convenient and designed with readers in mind. Our team is dedicated to bringing you the most accurate and insightful information about North Korea with content and analysis unavailable elsewhere. Don't delay. Download the NK News app from Apple's App Store or Google Play and stay connected with the latest North Korea news and analysis. The app also works with NK Pro subscriptions, offering full access to NK Pro content. Okay, welcome back. And joining me here in the studio today for our long interview on Monday, the 18th of December, is Dr. Michael Bozak, Deputy Secretary and International Relations Officer of the United Nations Command Military Armistice Commission. That's quite a mouthful. Welcome on the show. Can I call you Michael? Mike is fine if you Michael, don't mind. Okay, good. So, uh, a lot of questions to go through here. Gosh, that's a few. I've done my homework. Uh, let's see how far we can get in the time allotted to us. The United Nations Command Military Armistice Commission, or UNCMAC for short, is that a United Nations body or something else? Is, is it its own thing? No, it's its own thing. So United Nations Command was created in 1950 under the mandate from a UN Security Council resolution, specifically UN Security Council Resolution 84, but is a U.S.-led multinational command. For three years, the United Nations Command fought the war here in Korea, and then on 27 July 1953, an armistice agreement was signed. And when that armistice agreement was signed, it created three commissions, the Military Armistice Commission, the Neutral Nations Supervisory Commission, and the Neutral Nations Repatriation Commission. And the Military Armistice Commission is comprised of the parties of the conflict. It, the objective of the Military Armistice Commission is to oversee the implementation of the armistice and to negotiate resolution of any violations of the agreement. Okay, so the original members of the UNCMAC then, if I understand correctly, as of July 27, 1953, were... The UNC on one side, the United Nations Command, that is the U.S. and the, the alliance under it. And on the other side, the Chinese People's Volunteers and the Korean People's Army. That's correct. So you had three parties, two on one side, one on the other. But the, the one on the other, the UNC, is, is a multinational coalition. Right. What we would say is three signatories three represented signatories. by – and UNC was a signatory that represented all of the combat forces under the command and control of United Nations Command. Okay. And so – the parties of UNCMAC now are not necessarily the original ones, right? Because North Koreans and the Chinese have kind of left UNCMAC. Is that right? Is that the, the status? What's the status? Who's in there now? Well, right now the status would be that the United Nations Command and the Korean People's Army are continuing to oversee the implementation of the Armistice Agreement. Now, the Korean People's Army, they would say that they walked away from the armistice several times. I think the number is up to six at this point. Mm. From a practical perspective, though— we have United Nations Command on the one side in the Joint Security Area and the KPA Pamum Jam Mission on the other side, on the north side of the JSA. Okay, so you work for the, the MAC, the Military Armistice Commission, on this side, south of the demilitarized zone. That's correct. Right. Okay, and is your position a civilian or a mil military role? So I'm one of the few civilians in UNCMAC as the continuity for the organization. I think last November you had John Brzezinski who was here. Yeah. He was in the position for 20 years. Ah. I've been here for four and a half. Okay, so you're, in, you're the successor to, to John Brzezinski. That's correct. All right. Now, what's the relationship? We've got some lights doing funny things up here. What's the relationship of the UNC to UNCMAC? How do they relate to and how are they different from each other? So UNCMAC is the UNC component to the MAC, and we represent directly the UNC commander's equities as the signatory of the armistice. Again, UNC commander signed on behalf of all military forces. Now, the UNC component to the MAC is comprised of five members plus the UNCMAC secretary. So we have a ROC general officer who serves as a senior member. We have a U.S. member. We have a ROC member. We have a Commonwealth member and then a rotating member mm. from all of the UNC liaison officer states, which we currently have 17 UNC member states. Now, your, your head member is a ROC officer, Republic That's, of Korea officer. That's correct. Uh, although they're not, the Republic of Korea is not a signatory to the armistice. Is that a controversial thing? Do, do North Koreans like to make an issue of that? Well, that was the original issue that came up in 1991 when we, the UNC commander named a ROC officer to be the senior member of UNCMAC. The KPA protest said, well, the ROC is not a signatory to the armistice, and therefore we are not going to accept that a ROC officer is the senior member. However, that's a little bit of a historical inaccuracy. When we look at the practical applications of the terms, terms of armistice mm -hmm. and the process of negotiating the armistice, 
If we were to go back all the way to July 1951, when the armistice negotiations began, there was actually rock representation in the armistice conference. It was General Peck Sun Yup was mm. the original representative there, along with the other UNC negotiators. Now, as far as a practical application and the implementation of the armistice, the Republic of Korea has always been a, uh, a contributor to the implementation of the armistice. There is a uh, bilateral agreements that exist between the U.S. and the Republic of Korea about the regulations and how they'll be enforced. And then if we just look at it from a very practical perspective and how we do business today, you know, in UNCMAC, we have a U.S. Army colonel who serves as the secretary. The military deputy is a ROC Army colonel. We have several team leaders who are ROC military officers. And we also have what's called the ROC Advisory Group to UNCMAC, which is essentially liaison officers from ROC Joint Chiefs of Staff to be able to facilitate our mission in implementing the armistice. Okay, so you're a, a civilian in the UNCMAC. What, on a day-to-day basis, what does your work involve? <laughs> My day starts usually by waking up and checking DPRK state media to see if there's been any statements. For example, this morning we mm-hmm. had a statement that was attributed to the Ministry of National Defense. I check those messages to see if there's any sort of signaling that may be coming from our, our DPRK counterparts that could influence the, the actions of the day. I go into the op- office, usually I'm, I'm reviewing reports or writing reports uh, based on the mission that we have in overseeing the implementation of the armistice, and then addressing the different activities that we have going on, which we have uh, several lines of effort, which include things like armistice compliance inspections, special investigations, or in, uh, when the situation calls for it, communication and negotiation with the Korean People's Army. Okay, now last night, of course, within less than 24 hours ago, uh, North Korea fired a missile into, uh, into the ocean. Is that, technically speaking, a violation of the armistice? No, so missile launches are not technically armistice violations unless they are shown to be hostile acts. So if they fired the missile at the Republic of Korea, of Over course... Over the demilitarized zone. That's right. Of course, mm. that would be an armistice violation. Right. But the, what the act of firing a missile into the Sea of Japan, or the East Sea, as we call it here, is a violation of UN Security Council resolutions, mm-hmm. but not a violation of the armistice. Right. So do, does that impact you? I mean, did, were you woken up for that? Or if you weren't sleeping, did you have to go <laughs> and, and, and look at that? Well, we obviously monitor anything that happens because a missile launch, we yeah. have to determine that it's not heading this way. Right. So uh, for us in UNCMAC, we have a duty officer who's always on call ah. in case something happens. I just so happened to be the officer last night. Ah, so that was your job. Okay. That's right. Now, I, I specifically wanted to invite you on the show, and, and, and we've been working this out for what, close to a year now. I want to right. get you on the show because I understand that you know, you can give our listeners a big picture about how during time of greater and lesser tensions between North Korea and South Korea and the UN command, what mechanisms there are for de-escalation and mistake avoidance. And hopefully we can also get a little bit into the logistics of how hotlines are used and how messages are communicated between two sides. So uh, you've been there, the Deputy Secretary, for almost four and a half years. You started in August 2019. Which means you came into the, just a bit of context for our listeners, you came into the job six months after the failure of the Hanoi summit between uh, President Trump and, and Kim Jong-un, and almost a year before North Korea blew up the inter-Korean liaison office in Kaesong with explosives. So you got here right in time to see tensions escalate. Now, it's my understanding of UNCMAC that one of the jobs of implementing the armistice is to maintain the armistice and make sure that the frozen war doesn't go back to a hot and kinetic conflict. Is that more or less right? So one of the things I want to be clear on is that the armistice is not a static thing. It's in a lot of the criticism of the armistice is that it freezes the peninsula in a kind of a Cold War state. Mm. And I I fundamentally disagree with that premise. The armistice is a mechanism for furthering our, our advancement of the peace process here in the Korean Peninsula. And so when we look at the fundamental elements of what the armistice does, it gives us an opportunity to use those mechanisms for minimizing the risk of security incidents, for mitigating escalation cycles should they occur, and for accomplishing other tasks that you would consider among the six fundamental tasks for peace building here on the Korean Peninsula. So when you think about peace building, you don't typically think about military organizations, Mm. but Four of the six fundamental tasks are things that we contribute to, things like preserving a cessation of hostilities, like institutionalizing the peace process, and creating opportunities for nonviolent engagement. So we have various aspects of how we do this mission, but it's always forward-looking, always looking at opportunities, not just how do we can prevent 
a backslide towards hostilities, but how we can move forward to more peaceful conditions on the Korean Peninsula. Okay, but p- peace ultimately, you know, an agreement between the two Koreas or, or North Korea and the United States, that would be a, a political thing separate of a military thing, right? That's of course right. Right. So so the UNCMAC's job is to, to take care of the military side of things while the politicians get together and work out some sort of an agreement. That's correct. So give me the rundown once again, uh, for those who might have missed it, including me, uh, of those six fundamental tasks for peace building. Peace building, peace building. that's right. So the six fundamental tasks. The first is to achieve and preserve a cessation of hostilities. Mm -hmm. The second is to resolve sources of conflict. The third is mitigating obstacles to peace. The fourth is institutionalizing the peace process. Fifth is incentivizing the peace process. And sixth is creating opportunities for nonviolent engagement. Okay, and where are these recorded? Are they are these in the armistice or are these? No, this is just general concepts. And when we look at, so one of the things I do, I'm a student of peacemaking and Ah. peace building. And it helps me in my role here as the Deputy Secretary, International Relations Officer, Mm. to study conflicts across the globe. Right. And so these are the six fundamental concepts that you would have for peace building. Anywhere? Yes. Okay. So these are sort of principles for all times and all places. That's correct. And and we're seeing how they relate to the UNCMAC here in Korea. That's correct. Okay. All right. So what systems and mechanisms are in place for for de-escalation and risk mitigation right now between uh, North Korea and UNCMAC? I think the first thing we have to do is look at really the functions that we have as the Military Armistice Commission and and specifically UNCMAC, the UNC component to that. Mm -hmm. If I were to break it down, there's three core things that we do. The first is that we are a kind of an inspector general for the armistice agreement or quality assurance. We write regulations. We ensure that those regulations are being adhered to by the military forces along the DMZ and other armistice administered areas. So we do compliance inspections and investigations if there's any violations. Those rules are there to ensure that we can minimize the risk of incidents and to mitigate escalation should any incidents occur. The second function is we are essentially the KPA's accepted counterparts, that there is a designated area, neutral ground for dialogue at the joint security area. Mm -hmm. We have the line of communication and mechanisms for being able to engage at different levels if necessary. And then the third thing we provide is we're a crisis management mechanism, meaning that if an incident occurs, there are options other than the use of military force that the armistice provides for us to be able to de-escalate tensions and restore peace and security here on the Korean Peninsula. So as technology has improved, have new mechanisms come to exist and be employed? Certainly. uh, I was just talking to my predecessor, John Brzezinski, who's just a fount of knowledge Mm. about the evolution of the line of communication that we have. And and up until 2002, we were using an old Soviet-style crank phone. Mm. And uh, after the sinking of the Chomsky 357 in 2002, there was a decision by both sides that we needed to upgrade that hotline to allow for more fluid communication. Yeah, I want to get onto uh, the hotline. So let's just talk about how, how messages are communicated. So if the UNC wants to communicate a message to the North Korean side now, what would be the standard procedure? How would that normally, how would that begin? Well, there's different methods for doing so, of Mm. course. So we do have the line of communication, which has been in place for about 20 years now. Um, That You can initiate it through a phone call, or it could be done at the military demarcation line using a bullhorn to communicate. That's a very old tech, right? A bullhorn. (laughs) Or or a loud hailer, just going out there and basically projecting your voice physically. That's right. But, uh, you know, it it is effective. Is that because North Korea doesn't always answer the phone? That could be a reason that either they're not picking up the phone or there's something else, a a technical issue, for example. Yeah. Okay. So so it might start with a phone call or a bullhorn. That's right. uh, And and then how would that proceed? Like what if it how would that message then be delivered? Well, I, I don't want to get too much into the specifics of the hotline out of respect for the integrity of our hotline between the UNC and the KPA. But in general, we would have a message that's drafted. Our individuals who are up there 24-7, 365 would get a notification that there's a message that they need to convey to the other side. And then they would then relay that again via the phone or via bullhorn at the military demarcation line. Now, depending on the KPA side, how they receive those messages, I, I can't tell you with 100% certainty of, of how they record and convey those messages to higher headquarters, mm-hmm. especially when we do at the Bullhorn, because in the past, they used to have somebody come out there with a video camcorder and mm. record us. We would suspect that they would then take that message and, and transcribe it. They have other cameras in the JSA now, so whether or not those have audio recording capability, we're not sure. Uh, but we have some confidence that they're receiving those. Do they ever ask you to come out and read it again? Like, oh, sorry, we missed it. You know, Can you come and do it once more? Not since I've been here. Okay. In theory, it's, I guess it's possible. It is if possible. If they miss a message. That's yeah, right. or, or the camcorder didn't work or run out right. of battery or something. 
Okay. And what about when uh, the North Korea, the Korean People's Army wants to communicate a message to the UNC side? How does that work? Is that the same process but in reverse, or do they have a different way? Well, so one of the things that we have up in the Joint Security Area is personnel that's at our joint duty office, about 40 meters away from Pamungak, who are there 24-7, 365, mm-hmm. able to receive that phone call. So if, if the Korean People's Army wants to contact us at 2 o'clock in the morning, they pick up that phone, that phone is going to ring inside that building, wake up the individuals who are there, and they'll be able to answer that message. Okay. Now, what have you been told by your colleagues or predecessors like John Brzezinski about communication system in the past and how they work? Like I heard, for example, the, you used to put paper notes in pigeonholes, but the North Koreans stopped collecting them, and, or there were fax machines between the, the two sides. That's right. So in 2002, when they, the UNC and the KPA agreed to uh, upgrade the hotline— This is after the sinking of the ship that you mentioned, right? That's the, right. The, the Second Chom- Battle of Yonpyeongdo? That's right. The Chomps 3357. Right. There was a series of negotiations— one of the things that we said was let's update the uh, upgrade the hotline and we should go ahead and put a fax machine mm. in. And so we had a phone and a fax machine that would be used uh, if we needed to do so. Now the KPA stopped accepting faxes o- after a while. Mm. They didn't give a reason why. But you know, as far as conveying messages, we, there's not a whole lot that we would have needed to fax over to their side. And so we still have the phone line, but not necessarily the fax. Mm-hmm. As far as the what you mentioned about handing over documentation, that was really more on the Neutral Nations Supervisory Commission ah. side of the house. They have a box that they would use to put their reports in for right. the KPA side to receive. Okay, so that was really only from the NNSC. Right. So for us, if we wanted to hand over documentation, we would do it during a face-to-face meeting. Okay. Can that take place in one of those buildings along Conference Road, or can that just take place really anywhere in the Joint Security Area? So we have the three buildings on Conference Row. If anybody gets an opportunity to go up there, you'll see the three blue buildings. Mm-hmm. The one on the left is T1. That's the Neutral Nations Supervisory Commission building. The one in the middle, T2, is used for the Military Armistice Commission or its successor forum for talks, which is the General Officer Talks Forum. And if you want to, we can talk about that in this, uh, during this podcast here. The third building is T3, the military, uh, the UNCMAC conference room, which we use for staff officer talks. So if we were going to have documentation we wanted to pass face-to-face, depends on the level you would do it at. So if it's a staff officer or secretary's meeting, that will happen in T3, that right building on conference row, and Mm -hmm. we would be able to hand over the documentation. If it was a general officer level meeting, it would be in T2. Which is the one that tourists used to go to? Most the of, T2. That was T2. That's and right. that's where the general officers talk. That's correct. Okay. So going back to uh, methods of communication, you've, you've talked about how the UNC would give a message to the Korean People's Army and vice versa. Do you know anything that you can share with us about similar mechanisms for de-escalation and communication that exist between the two Koreas? That's right. So they have a series of hotlines too. The first one that they established was the Red Cross hotline mm. in 1971. And then, as you know, that they signed the North-South Joint Communique, which called upon another hotline being created, which was uh, between National Intelligence Service and their counterpart organization. That was established in 1972. Mm -hmm. They had two more military-military hotlines established in 2003 and 2004 when they opened up the transportation corridors Mm -hmm. across the DMZ. The ROC and the DPRK call them joint administration areas. Those hotlines uh, have been in, in existence since then. We have the Inter-Korean Liaison Line that was established when the Inter-Korean Liaison Office was evacuated in uh, January 2020. There was a a separate line opened up for the Ministry of Unification. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there one between leaders? Do you happen to know? That I don't know. So, okay. th- In fact, NK News has reported on it. There's, there's been other series of hotlines that have right. been established between government officials, but those are, uh, privi- those are sovereign issues between the two Koreas. Sure. So over the years, really, there's been lots of, well, not lots, but there's been more than a handful of, uh, of hotlines from various bodies to various bodies across the demilitarized zone. And so sometimes, occasionally, we, we see reporting in the mainstream media that uh, you know, North Korea has cut off the hotline. Does that mean that Normally, that a physical a physical act has happened, or they just stopped answering the phone. Well, I think 2020 and 2021 is pretty illustrative here, because I, in 2020, they during the unilateral escalation cycle, where we saw a series of, of high level statements attributed to people like Kim Yo Jong saying that they're going to destroy the inter Korean liaison office mm. and cease communications because of the balloon launches that were happening. Yeah, they said they were going to cut communications. Well, really, that means that they're going to stop answering the phone. Uh, they keep the hardware intact, and right. then uh, we saw in 2021 
in July, on, it was actually on the 27th of July, they said they're going to restore communications. Then during U.S. Rock Allied exercise in August, they cut the communications across the Korean hotlines again. Mm-hmm. And then they restored them again in October 2021, which means they just started picking up the Pick phone up the again. Phone. Right. So, so people from the south side keep ringing, and then it's up to the North Korea whether they decide to pick up or not. Yeah, that's my understanding, yes. Right. Now, we reported about a month or two ago here at, at NK News about a, a South Korean naval vessel that crossed the northern limit line somewhere to the east of Korea to help a North Korean vessel that was in difficulties. And because there was, at that stage, no working hotline, they fed information to the media almost in real time to let North Korea know what was going on through a very unorthodox channel, but basically to avoid any kind of an escalation. Can you comment on that at all? Actually, that was one of the the small successes that we've had in mm. terms of armistice enforcement and, and using the mechanisms uh, associated with what we have available. Ah. So in that incident, um, it was, I believe it was the 29th of October, we got a notification from our rock counterparts they needed to cross the northern limit line to support a distressed vessel. And this is normally the way they should do this. Is that is that correct? That they should normally notify notify you before doing something like that. Well, so the Northern Limit Line isn't formally established under the Armistice Ah. Agreement, but they did it as a measure of a prudent prudent measure because obviously any sort of crossing of a de facto boundary could create some sort of uh, incident. So we were notified that this was going to happen. Mm -hmm. The ROC military, ROC Navy specifically, went out to provide food and water, check to see what the status was of the individuals, confirmed that they wanted to return back to the DPRK. We then received the grid coordinates for where the vessel was located. Mm -hmm. And so while, yes, the the Republic of Korea military published that information, we also passed the information to our KPA counterparts. Through your usual channels. That's correct. Okay, so uh, one way or another they were getting it. That's right. And a couple hours later, that that vessel was able to be recovered by uh, DPRK authorities, which was uh, after being adrift for about 10 days, I think it was the reported uh, length, uh, is success story for humanitarian causes. Yeah. Okay. And and. You would see that as this is the armistice at work the way that it should be. The, in terms of being able to use the practical mechanisms that's afforded to us, this is exactly why we have these mechanisms in place. Good, good. Okay, so even though the inter-Korean channels and hotlines are occasionally uh, cut off or not answered, one view I've heard is that North Korea likes to keep the hotline to the UNC as the final last-ditch backstop in case everything goes wrong, and they can call basically the UNC, and a bit like phoning 911 in the USA, because the UNC will shut everything down on the southern side of the demilitarized zone and pause all action. So it's a way of kind of a, a last resort, stop everything button if the North feels under threat. Can you comment on that? Well, they've never explained to me what their rationale is for cutting off one set of hotlines versus another. So I can't really speculate any further than that. But I- it's nice to be able to have mechanisms in place, mm. whether it's into Korean, whether it's UNC KPA, because any of those mechanisms is useful in terms of uh, addressing any sort of crisis or contingency. Yeah, it, it just seems that it's funny that when times are good and when there's a spirit of rapprochement, that it seems like North Korea is more willing to use these mechanisms and forms of, of communications and channels for de-escalation. But when times are getting tense and when there's bad will and mistrust on both sides, in other words, precisely when you want to have an institutionalized form of de-escalation and, and risk mitigation, those are the times when North Korea either disconnects or disengages. Well, they're always present in the joint security area. So when you say disengaged, I think it's very important to recognize that we've had a series of incidents, but they're still present there. And we use these mechanisms, whether it's the sinking of the Chonan, the shelling of Yumpyondo, the sinking of Chomsuri 357. You know, my predecessor, John Brzezinski, mm. lived through many of those, and as well as uh, his forebears. But having that presence at the neutral ground for dialogue, that's the, the backstop for everything, to have that presence 24-7, 365. Can you, so can you tell us a bit more about the general officers' talks and the staff officers' talks, and, and what, what do the different levels hope to achieve, and, and what are they there for? What's the institution of them? Yeah, so I think uh, it's really important, and I'm going to sound like I'm giving a history lesson here, but I think it's important to know the history so that we can understand the present-day mechanism. So the Military Armistice Commission, again, was established to be able to supervise the implementation of the armistice and negotiate any violations of the agreement. The Military Armistice Commission, I think, met 458 times between 1953 and 1991. And then we had the lower level meetings that would happen, the secretary's meetings, which is a 06 colonel level, and then staff officer talks, which is 0405, like a major lieutenant colonel, your action officer level. Now, the Military Armistice Commission met for any number of major incidents over the years. And then when we decided, it was 1991, as you recall, Jack, it was Mm. a period of 
rapprochement between the two Koreas, uh, No Tae Woo's Nord Politic. Right. Uh, he had the the basic agreement was the agreement on reconciliation, non aggression, cooperation and exchanges. Uh, yes. So I got it on record. I could remember that. <laughs> Excellent. So the, uh, th- during that period, we rec- recognized that there was an opportunity to try to support inter-Korean engagement. And so appointment of a ROC senior member seemed to be the natural, logical thing to do. Mm-hmm. Of course, the KPA rejected that. And so they started distancing themselves from the Military Armistice Commission. The last actual formal MAC meeting was in 1991. But we had a series of incidents between 1991 through the 90s where we said we really need to have this general officer level mechanism for dialogue. Mm. And so in 1998, we, we negotiated and concluded a subsequent agreement to the armistice. So it's a formal implementation arrangement between UNC and the KPA. So is it, is it like an amendment or an annex to the armistice? Well, again, we call it subsequent agreements to the armistice, okay. but it's, it's uh, because we've never amended the text itself. Yes. All these subsequent agreements are included in our portfolio of how we implement the armistice. Okay. And so it is a formal agreement that's signed by UNC and KPA representatives to establish the general officer talks form. Mm-hmm. And from 1998, that's the mechanism we've used for the general officer level dialogue that would happen in response to any sort of major crisis, contingency, or incident. Right. And so it's what we used in response to uh, the Yugo submarine incident in 1998. We used it in response to Chomsky 357, again, in, in response to Yon Do. And what that is, is a mechanism for doing a few things for you. Really, you get to exchange information on both sides, understanding of the event. You get to exchange your interests, constraints, and restraints. And and at the general officer level, you may exchange positions from your military perspective on the event, and then try to negotiate some sort of resolution from a military to military level. Okay. And um, what about the the other level of talks? uh, That's right. So it's the staff officer and, and secretary's meetings. Yes. So the staff officer meeting is really, it's an action officer level. So you're really focused on exchange of information and trying to set up for those other meetings. Now, the exchange of information is really important because then it allows you to understand, you know, maybe the KPA is communicating that this incident was not intentional or that they view it as being something different than we view it. Mm-hmm. So ex- information exchange is already critical for mitigating the risk of misinterpretation, miscalculation. At the secretary's meetings, there's a little bit more authorities that are afforded to the UNCMAC secretary and to the secretary of the KPA Pamum John Mission. The UNCMAC secretary is your direct boss, right? That's correct. You're the deputy secretary. That's correct. Okay. So the secretaries are able to conclude some levels of agreement. Now, the, the main one that they would do is, say, repatriations, mm-hmm. where they could negotiate and conclude the date, time, location, and uh, attestation of repatriations. So they have that additional layer of authority in terms of what they can a- agree upon in the implementation of the armistice. And then again, general officer level, you go up higher, you have a higher level of authority and a level of representation from the military perspective. So obviously for all these these three levels of meetings, the general officers, the staff officers, the secretaries, you've got representatives of the United Nations Command on one side, the Korean People's Army on the other side. Are the Neutral Nations Supervisory Commission people normally invited to join in those meetings? Not typically for that because it is strict business of the Military Armistice Commission mechanisms. Ah. Uh, the NNSC is separate. So we don't typically invite NNSC personnel to go into those meetings. However, we would give them information about what happened, when is going on, so they could track those things for their own records. So they have their own separate meetings. That's correct. So they meet every day in T1, mm-hmm. the uh, Swiss and Swedish members of the NNSC. Uh-huh. Okay. And presumably they meet separately with you and separately with the Cape well, the U.S. UNCMAC and separately with the Korean People's Army. That's right. We work very closely with the NNSC. You know, uh, it's a very useful mechanism to have third-party oversight of what we do here. It helps keep us honest, make sure that we're doing the business as best as we can. Right. Uh, and they're, they're very forthright in their feedback to us about how we can improve our processes. Now, there used to be uh, NNSC representatives on the northern side, right, the Poles and the Czechoslovaks that were sent home in the 1990s by North Korea, so they're no longer welcome there. Does the NNSC, I mean, is the NNSC blocked in its cooperation or co- communication with the KPA? Does the KPA talk to the Swiss and the Swedes, or do they not recognize them either? I defer many of these uh, comments to the NNSC, but just from my understanding, what I've observed in the joint security area, the KPA Pomum Jam does not interact with the Neutral Nations Supervisory Commission. But as you know, Jacko, the, the Swiss and Swedish governments have strong diplomatic relations with Pyongyang, yeah. two of the largest contingents overseas are, are in Geneva and Stockholm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I don't know how much level NSC contact has with their home governments and whether they use those mechanisms. But certainly 
in NSC uh, it provides a valuable mechanism and tool for us on the south side to ensure that everybody's adhering to the terms of armistice. Okay, now I've got a long question with a long setup. Yesterday was December the 17th, by my reckoning, the 29th anniversary of the shooting of a helicopter with two U.S. Army helicopter pilots in it. One was killed and the other, Bobby Hall, spent about two weeks in North Korean captivity before he was released. The late Bill Richardson, who was then member of the U.S. House of Representatives, helped to negotiate Bobby Hall's release. In September this year, just after the passing away of Ambassador Richardson, NK News published an op-ed piece by your predecessor, John Brzezinski, titled, Former Governor Bill Richardson Helped Free uh, Free Americans in DPRK, But at What Cost? And uh, in that piece, John argued that Richardson undermined the United Nations Command and the Armistice uh, Commission by negotiating the release of Bobby Hall because the Armistice Agreement was already existing as a framework to return members of the military who, for one reason or another, end up on the wrong side of the demilitarized zone. But then I heard from somebody else that actually it wasn't Richardson who undermined the UNC and the institutions set up through the Armistice Agreement, but rather it was the Korean People's Army who used Mr. Richardson because he happened to be in Pyongyang at the time and that the KPA had been, as we've already discussed, keen to undermine or go around the UN command ever since 1991 when the first rock officer was made a, uh, a head of the, of the UNCMAC. So if you want to, uh, you can comment on that. <laughs> well, look, it's, uh, let's go back and again, another history lesson here. Let's actually look at what happened in that incident because Bill Richardson, Governor Richardson, you know, late great Rich, uh, Governor Richardson, he, he was there in Pyongyang already on business. The incident occurs and he helped negotiate the release of the repatriation of the remains mm-hmm. of the, the fallen pilot. Now, there was other negotiations that happened. It was actually the U.S. State Department's uh, Dep- De- Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, Thomas Hubbard, who flew to Pyongyang and, and helped negotiate the release of, of Bobby Hall. So mm. there's, there was different levels of negotiations with different individuals. UNC still played a role in facilitating the repatriation via the Joint Security Area in Pamam Jam. Now, you know, what's the best method for doing so? I think that it's important in the way I look at the armistice. It's a mechanism for having positive outcomes. And we can actually tie this back to the most recent incident where we had Private Travis King run across the military demarcation line. The armistice mechanism was one option that was afforded to be able to bring Private King back to the United States. The DPRK chose another option, which was keeping him in detention for 71 days and then deporting him. Sweden, acting as the protecting power for the United States, facilitated that deportation, and then he ended up making it back. And both of those situations, can I say that, that the outcomes were poor? Well, they, the outcomes were positive and ultimately. So how would we look at it? Well, I think uh, we would try to find the best mechanism for achieving the positive outcome, but there's many mechanisms that's always going to be afforded to us, and we'll pick the one that's going to be the most viable at the time. Okay, so that, that sounds like a, a rather pragmatic approach. So in terms of returning a, a, a soldier who, for whatever reason, is on the wrong side of the demilitarized zone, the armistice agreement is is one of several tools that may be used. Yeah, and of course, uh, from our perspective, we say let's use the one that we're involved in because we're ready to go. We got 24-7, right. 365, but that may not be the circumstances at the time. Right. Now, in, 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 uh, we've already jumped ahead to my next question, which is about Travis Smith. But in, in go, choosing to go a different route or route, as I would say, the North Koreans, are they trying to undermine the UNC? Is that what their game is? Or are they just deciding we, we like this option better for some other reason? Well, I wish I could say that, that both sides, we, we were always operating like we knew everything at the time. We had perfect information and everything was calculated. But really, I mean, I, how much of this was an unexpected occurrence for the DPRK side? Mm-hmm. You know, how many, when's the last time we had a uh, U.S. service member run across the military demarcation line in the Joint Security Area? The answer is never. And so unprecedented situation occurs and they have to respond to it the same way that we responded to it, which was to look at the options available and what constraints and restraints they had based on their respective systems from ours and from theirs. So I think they responded to it in that way. Uh, That's why they took the path that they did. But I'd I'd like to highlight this as Mm. as a a little bit of a segue here, but to demonstrate some of the progress that we've had using the armistice mechanisms, how we've built upon things from the past. Because I look at that situation and I look at it as such a positive in terms of where we've come from going back to, to some of these past instances we've, that's occurred there. So in Korea Risk Group, I know you guys have Andre Longkov. He was in the Joint Security Area when uh, Mutuzak ran across the military demarcation line in 1984. Mm. And in that incident, we had a firefight where we had multi, multiple soldiers killed on both sides. Yeah. 
In 2017, Corporal O runs across the military demarcation line. Yes, he makes it across, but he's got five bullet holes in him. Mm. In July 2023, Private King runs across, and he is deported from the DPRK 71 days later without a scratch on his head. So it's it's to me, it's a, a good symbol, symbol of the progress that we've been able to achieve. If we can continue that that linear line, that would be. Uh, but sometimes we, sometimes things have a way of going forwards and then backwards again. And that's, you know, but I will tell you that in any peace process, because I've studied peace processes across the globe, Mm -hmm. it's, it is never a linear line. It's never easy. There's always going to be complications, always be challenges. And it's always going to feel like you're taking one step forward and two steps back. Our goal is to go two steps forward. And sometimes we're going to get one step back, but then we're going to try to go two steps forward again. And that's how peace is ultimately achieved. I want to come back to that, but we've already raised Trevor Smith, so let's let's go into that for a moment there, because we were going to have an inter- this interview, this very interview we were going to have in July, <laughs> but that was all scuppered when Trevor Smith chose to run across the border. Can you tell us how you observed or became aware of that event and how that impacted your work as Deputy Secretary of UNCMAC? Well, as, as I mentioned, whenever incidents occur, we get notifications very quickly because we need to be, as UNCMAC, when, when crisis occurs or when an incident occurs, that's when we are really going to kick into high gear and do our job. And so in fact, uh, I found out about that literally seconds after it occurred wow. where our joint duty officer contacted us to let us know that somebody had run across the military demarcation line. And I don't want to get too much in the specifics of what happened next, but ultimately we were kicked into gear. We initiated an investigation. We started the process of trying to communicate with the other side to try to use armistice mechanisms to be able to resolve the situation. And so that was something I was involved in greatly up in the joint security area, supporting the team up there and uh, providing advice to, to the decision makers who were ultimately trying to determine how to navigate this situation. Now, I know it's a specific case, but what can you say about how that communication worked? Uh, unfortunately, I can't get into specific details about that. I think General Harrison mentioned it in his podcast with you that, that we may seek to use similar mechanisms in the future. We don't want to put too much out here. And again, our, our line of communication is a practical tool. It's not a public messaging one. So uh, I'll, I'll hold comment on that for this time. Okay. Now, you said that you've, you've studied uh, peace and peacemaking around the world, different conflicts and things. Is that how you got your PhD? Well, so my PhD was focused on intergovernmental negotiations. And then I recognized that I needed uh, to really focus on this process of peace building and how we uh, might do it here on the Korean Peninsula. We've been at it here on the Korean Peninsula for 70 years since the armistice was signed. Do you feel that there's any signs of, I mean, is real peace being built here? Well, I think I want to go to a fundamental concept here, and it's the concept of a negative peace and a positive peace. Mm. You know, so a lot of people look at peace as a binary. You either have war or you have peace. But really, peace exists along a spectrum, and that spectrum runs from war through a negative piece, which is the absence of hostilities, and then a positive piece, which is the presence of relationships, linkages, and ties, such that would render the use of military force either untenable or unfathomable. And so what peacemaking is, is this process of trying to achieve a negative piece. And what peace building is, is building towards a positive piece. Now, to illustrate the difference between a negative piece and a positive piece, because I recognize it sounds probably pretty theoretical, let me use an example here. Now, let's say we have a U.S. reconnaissance aircraft that's flying in the region, and it accidentally gets shot down by a Japan self-defense force air defense unit. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say that same reconnaissance aircraft is flying in the region, and it accidentally gets shot down by a Korean People's Army air defense unit. In which of those situations are we more likely to see a resumption of hostilities? Probably the latter. Right. right. So in your mind, it's very clear, and I'm sure the mind of uh, the listeners out there is very clear. But why is that? I mean, if you think about it, The U.S. was in a total war with Japan from 1941 to 1945 after a sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. Not too different in time and space, we were fighting a war here on the Korean Peninsula. So why is it in one situation, it's unfathomable to think that we're going to resume hostilities. The Mm. other one is very plausible. Therein lies the difference between a positive peace and a negative peace. Now, when I think about whether we've actually achieved some sort of positive progress towards positive peace in the Korean Peninsula, I look back and I think about my, my... relatives, actually. My grandfather fought in the Korean War. He uh, was trained as a Korean linguist. He came back to the Korean Peninsula in 1966 Mm. or 67. He was here during the seizure of the Pueblo and the Blue House raid. My older brother was stationed here on the Korean Peninsula when the Chomsuri 357 was sunk. He was part of Ankh-Mak in 2013. So 
is it better now for where I'm at sitting in this job than when my older brother was stationed here and older, ben, when my uh, grandfather was here? Uh, yes, it's better. In terms of the, the conventional military confrontation, things are better now than they've ever been. But when we look at the problem sets here on the Korean Peninsula, it doesn't mean that we don't have problems. Mm -hmm. So for me, I have to bucket it out. I have to look at it from military forces. The problem sets we look at here is denuclearization, deterrence, and conventional military confrontation. That armistice piece is managing that conventional military confrontation. Obviously, there's still issues with those other two areas, which is why we're seeing some of the things that we're seeing today. There are, uh, of course, the peace activists in the United States and in South Korea and in many other countries around the world who have made strong criticisms of things like the Armistice Agreement and, and the United Nations Command and the U.S. military presence in South Korea. They say that these are uh, outdated and they should be done away with and, and there should be an end of war declaration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and I'm just wondering how do you react to, to people who say that if you're really a peace builder, you shouldn't be working with UNCMAC, you should be working with the peace activists trying to get American troops out of Korea. Well, I, I would want anybody who wants to, to support the peace process here to really focus on those six fundamental tasks for peace building, come up with concrete ideas for how to, uh, to pursue them. UNC has continually sought to facilitate any measures that are, are going to help build the peace process here. A good example of that is the early 2000s when Kim Dae-jung administration wanted to pursue the sunshine policy. Uh, they wanted to open overland transit routes. Right. Uh, UNC sat down with KPA counterparts and negotiated the opening of transportation corridors east and west, which obviously the two Koreas negotiated uh, the implementation arrangements for that. But those transportation corridors remain in place. We have permanent personnel uh, corridor control officers from UNC stationed at Transportation Corridor East and West right wow. now oh. to maintain the viability of those corridors. And so it's road and rail on both sides, isn't it? That's correct. Yeah. Any organization that's looking at contributing to that really comes down to looking at what's necessary to build towards it. I would encourage them to look at concrete measures to use the the government uh, governments that are in place to pr propose those ideas and anything that's viable those governments can pursue it, and UNC in general has, has sought to facilitate those. So overall, would you say that, that methods for de-escalation and risk mitigation continue to work despite the tension that's rising between the two Koreas? Well, I, I mean, Jack, you've been here since uh, July 1996, is that right? On and off. Yeah, so uh, you've seen some of the major incidents that have occurred. And the four and a half years that I've been here, the two most significant armistice violations that I've observed since uh, that's involved both the North and the South mm -hmm. has been an uh, exchange of fire incident in the DMZ 3 May 2020 and the drone incursion incident mm -hmm. on 26 December 2022. Compare those to some of the incidents we've had in the past. We have not reached the level of crisis that we've have seen in the past and I think that's a success story. Obviously, we're still looking at the issues that are happening. We had the missile launch last night. We had an ICBM launch this morning. According to the news, I, I haven't actually been to see the specifics on it. Yeah. Uh, but these things, the, you know, as the DPRK marches towards its nuclear missile programs, it's going to create problems because they're disrupting the, the, the security equilibrium in Northeast Asia. They're flouting the rules-based international order. They're creating a proliferation risk, and they're increasing fear and anxiety among our allies and partners. That creates problems, but we're trying to manage that. And I think the armistice gives us that tool for preventing and escalation in terms of conventional military confrontation. Now, last month, North Korea and South Korea both put a satellite up into orbit. And as a result, recently, North Korea has decided to suspend the comprehensive military agreement and refortify its positions on the northern side of the military demarcation line and occupy observation and guard posts. What can you say about that? As far as the change that we've seen, I can't get too much into detail for operational security reasons. We know that the DPRK has announced that they can consider the CMA to be annulled, that they promise to take steps to, to demonstrate that they're no longer bound by its terms. I think it's, let's, if we go back and look at the CMA, I think it's important to recognize that UNC looks at any of these inter-Korean agreements that, that seeks to build upon the armistice and introduce risk reduction and tension reduction measures is something that that we support, which is why UNC supported the implementation of the CMA. At this point in time, though, what we need to do is we need to, to conduct a concrete threat assessment and risk analysis to, to determine what's actually changing based on the DPRK's actions and its announcement. And when we look at danger, I think it's important to, to break it down into threat and risk. So threat being a combination of capability and intent, and risk being a combination of likelihood and consequence. So any observers out there who are listening to this, you know, this is how you know, we and UNCMAC look at it. And what are the capabilities that are changing? Mm -hmm. 
What is the intent? Mm. Is there an intent to commit hostile acts? Is that has that changed? And then from risk, you know, what's the likelihood that a security incident could happen? And what's the consequence of that security incident? So all this analysis is taking place. UNC is working closely with the Republic of Korea counterparts to try to remain in lockstep as we navigate this new normal. How has the intent of the Korean People's Army uh, been assessed to have changed in the last month? Well, from again, I can't get into too many details from an operational security perspective, but from an UNCMAC perspective, I can't say that I've observed anything. But again, this is something that's being discussed at, at higher levels, and, uh, and we'll see where it goes from here. And how will this affect the work of, of UNCMAC, the, uh, the suspension of the, of the CMA? Well, for us, in many ways, it doesn't affect anything that we do because we have the armistice in place. The mm-hmm. armistice remains in effect. The DMZ is still there. We have all the rules and provisions for military forces here. So for us, it just means continuing to do our job. Nothing has changed in that aspect of it. If you know, Obviously, if there's an incident that occurs based on any reactions to this, we would be engaged to do, respond to that. But that, again, is no different than anything we've done for the past 70 years. Are soldiers of both sides in the joint security area once more carrying revolvers? Again, I can't comment on that for operational security reasons. Okay. Uh, I had to give it a shot. Uh, I, I, I respect you for doing it. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Michael Bozak, Deputy Sur- Secretary and International Relations Officer of the United Nations Command Military Armistice Commission, for coming on the NK News podcast today. Hey, thank you so much for having me, Jack. It's been a real pleasure. Keep building that positive peace. We'll work towards it. Thank you. Ever feel overwhelmed with the complexity of trying to understand what's going on with North Korea? Don't fret, NK Pro is here to help. Built on the strong reputation of NK News, NK Pro combines decades of experience with cutting edge technology to offer the best in North Korea related information. Here's the deal you get daily analysis and exclusive news, along with amazing research tools that let you tap into a vast range of open source North Korean information, such as state media search and data extraction, real time ship and aircraft movement tracking, and A to Z directories of people, companies, and organizations inside and outside the company. Yes, you heard that right. NK Pro is perfect for those in policy, business, and research who need quality, reliable, and timely insights. It's not just about staying informed, it's about understanding the key signals that can change the course of the future. So why wait? Dive deep into the realm of North Korea with NK Pro and navigate the landscape like a pro. After all, knowledge is power. Interested? Visit nknews.org slash professionals to claim your free 30-day trial of NK Pro. Once again, that's nknews.org slash professionals. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of our podcast episode for today. Our thanks go to Brian Betts and Alana Hill for facilitating this episode and to our post-recording producer genius, Gabby Magnuson, who cuts out all the extraneous noises, awkward silences, bodily functions, and fixes the audio levels. Thank you, and listen again next time. <laughs>